Hey guys, today we're going to talk a little bit about comparing bacteria and archaea. Um, it's going to be a lot of definitions and sort of memory work, so bear with me in this one. It's a little dry. Not as cool as viruses. So when we compare bacteria and archaea, we have to remember that they both are part of the prokaryotic um, version of cells, not the eukaryotic. So they're single cellular. Um, they're pretty simple. And they are of two different domains. Therefore, they are as far apart as you can get. Something like a whale and an apple are more related to each other than bacteria and archaea. When we compare them, we have to look at things like cell type, their morphology, so their shape, their aggregation, which means how they communicate with each other and connect to each other, their nutrition, the habitats they live in, and their reproduction. And these will all show similarities and differences between the two domains. When we compare them, the similar similarities that they have are they are prokaryotic. Um, they will have similar shapes, so they'll be cocci or spheres. Multiple will be coccus, and then or singular will be coccus, and then they have bacilli, which are rods, and multiple would be bacillus. Um, and they also have spiral cells. No fancy word there, just spiral cells. Hmm. Some species form aggregations. That means they actually come together to perform a larger function. So where one cell might be um, producing oxygen and another cell might be creating um, DNA bridges. So they can com communicate as like a community of similar cells. For energy, species either consume other organisms or they use inorganic compounds. So they can actually go ahead and eat other organisms or just the um, elements and chemicals around them. Species will live in both aerobic, which means oxygen present, and anaerobic, which means oxygen absent, habitats. Both are found in very extreme environments. Uh, more archaea live in extreme habitats, so they are considered extreme files, while more bacteria will live in moderate habitats, which are mesophiles. And they reproduce by binary fission and can exchange genetic content by conjugation. And we'll talk more about those things in a minute. When we look at them and their differences, some of them just don't fit into that caucus, bacilli, and spiral shaped. Um, they might be pyramids or cubes or rods with star sections. And some um, archaea are shaped like plates or rectangular rods. So they kind of just don't fit in that way. Some bacteria are photosynthetic. For some bacteria are photosynthetic, blah, 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 blah. while some archaea are methanogenic, which means they produce methane gas as an anaerobic byproduct. They can live aerobically, anaerobically, like we said, without oxygen, and that typically is for bacteria, where archaea live anaerobically without oxygen in cattle guts. So they kind of have happy places where they like to be. When we talk about extremophiles, those that live in um, extreme conditions, we're looking at archaea. So there's three that come up a lot. They're thermophiles, those ones that live in hot temperatures of so hot springs, deep water vents, and the temperature is always either boiling or higher. Acetophiles like volcanoes, they like mines, they like sulfur beds, they like it when it's acidic and the pH is low. And halophiles like salt, they like lakes, islands, the sea, um, anything that has a concentration above 20%. When archaea and bacteria reproduce, they do so asexually. Um, and what happens is they pretty, the cell just pretty much just becomes big and it splits. A fancy word for this is binary fission. And what happens is the genetic material on the inside of the nucleus um, remember, we said it's not bound inside of a cell so much. It's just sort of kind of around. Um, it's, it doesn't have any membrane-bound organelles. So what it actually does is just copy the genetic material that it has. The cell will grow. The genetic material will split. And then the cell will split into two cells. So it's kind of like a cloning. So each cell after it looks identical. There's very little room for mutation or mixing of genetic material here. However, if the condition isn't so favorable, DNA can exchange instead of 
reproducing by binary fission. So if they can't actually reproduce by splitting, what they do is they'll conjugate. So one cell will link to another by a pilus or a tube, kind of looks like a bridge in the microscope, and it transfers a copy of some or all of the chromosomes to another cell. That cell that has now accepted the new DNA will then go on to do binary fission, which is nice because it mixes the gene pool as we discussed. So it gets new genetic material in the cell after it is no longer identical anymore. In addition, bacteria and archaea have these little things called DNA loops, or they're plasmids. They're actually separate from the DNA chromosome that's in the main center of the archaea or bacteria. Plasmids can transfer through conjunction as well, and they'll, re they'll um, result in new genetic combinations, which again increases the biodiversity. If for some reason the bacteria needs to sort of protect itself, it can actually create a hardened wall called an endospore and store all of its genetic material. When the endospore comes out, it's almost impossible to attack the bacteria. It's not an active bacteria. It is now an actual different thing. We call it an endospore. And it's pretty much resistant to high temperatures, drying out, freezing, radiation, toxic chemicals. And when its ideal conditions return, it will remove the endospore and then return to its active bacteria, like a safety net. When we actually go to classify them and talk about the differences, the main things we talk about are size and shape. We talk about its nutrition, how they move, their genetic components, and their gram staining. Gram staining is a sort of the main way to go. It's the first place to start when we're looking at different bacteria and archaea. Gram staining will divide the two groups. So you'll get a gram positive and a gram negative. What it does is it separates bacteria into two groups. So these species can either stain with a thick protein layer um, on their cell wall, and they'll um, become purple or gram positive. And those that will not stain because they have a thin protein layer, they end up becoming pink. It's two different processes. So if I'm a gram positive cell and you try and stain me gram negative, I will not take on that pink color. I will only take on the purple color. So you essentially have to do both tests and see which one takes. Looking at bacteria in human health, it's sort of the main concern. We know that bacteria can harm us in different ways. We know things like E. coli, and in here we have um, botulism, so that's the Clostridium botulinum, which contains is food poisoning, so things that aren't cooked properly can give you food poisoning, but also dented cans tend to get this bacteria a lot because there's no air for growth, so they gain this like mold and bacteria that develops and does the binary fission, and you get more and more of it, it grows. Streptococcus biogenes, the plot pyogenes, sorry, they cause strep throat. Mm, some of us know that that's not a great feeling, um, but it is a bacteria, so you can just take an antibiotic for it. And whether, rather than waiting out its um, cycle. And streptococcus mutans cause tooth decay. So the stuff you don't brush off in the morning or at night um, will sit there and multiply and eat away at your enamel. Bacteria are important though. They are decomposers. So they break down organic material and they release all the things that we need in the air. Carbon, hydrogen, nit nitrogen, sulfur. And they support the, the nutrient cycles that we need for breathing, for growing, for soil, for plants. Um, and that's their process of either photosynthesis. Cyanobacteria is a major producer of all the oxygen gas on Earth. So without it, we'd kind of be um, stuck and not breathing. Some species in the archaea have enzymes that are special for our um, specific needs as humans, so they can withstand extreme temperatures, um, salt environments, acid environments, and biotech, of course, Q in biotech every time, takes advantage of this and they'll remove these enzymes and do research and try and insert them to our genetic and our sort of environments that we may need them for. We're always playing, right, with humans and different science and different ways to make us more successful or survive things. So there's always biotech in every situation. 
Again, I ask, what will 36 years from now look like for you guys? Hopefully I'm still alive. Anyway, so that's about it. Again, pretty dry. Um, tomorrow we'll look at some slides um, under the microscope and look at different bacteria and uh, their different compositions. we we'll be able to see cells a little bit in their circular or their cocci or their bacilli and they stick and how they all kind of congregate together. Hopefully that all um, sticks with you. Sorry again, a little bit dry. Sometimes it's not fun.